Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. The principles of employment and the nature of work are evolving at a rapid pace indeed. So what are the skills that will help ensure work readiness globally? What is the role of digital equality in that equation? And what do we need from the range of stakeholders who inevitably are going to have to collaborate to close the skills gap? Those are the framing questions for our conversation today. It's a big topic. We have an august panel. Um, and so let's dive right in. I'm going to ask each panelist to um, agree, disagree, or some variation thereof with the thesis statement I'm about to read. And at the same time, please take an opportunity to introduce your organization. You each, each of your organizations play such an important role in this topic. So the thesis statement is this. There is a definable set of skills that are essential for work readiness. Those skills are global, and they will be predictable for at least the next decade. Ashish, I'll begin with you. I love it. We didn't actually, uh, we didn't actually get this thesis <laughs> statement before we got on stage, so we're all going to be the ad-libbing impromptu to these right complicated questions. So that I get to go fun. first. So my name is Ashish Advani. I run an organization called Junior Achievement Worldwide, JA Worldwide. Um, we reach about 10.5 million young people um, every year, 118 countries, so very global. So this question is, I think, relevant to my day job. Um, I think one thing we've learned in reaching kids, particularly in, at the high school age, is there is this hunger for learning and a hunger for learning by doing as opposed to learning by sitting in a classroom. So as we think about you know, how to use this platform, this distribution network to reach young people, we are constantly asking ourselves, what should we be teaching? So what are the skills that are relevant for the future of jobs? Our mission is to prepare young people for the future of jobs, so you know, down the fairway of your question. Um, I think one thing we've learned is that uh, the core skill of having self-belief is perhaps one of the greatest predictors of, of employability and success. So how do you develop the self-confidence and self-belief, what's also called self-efficacy in the research, to actually feel that you will be able to thrive in an environment where the average young person is going to have you know, over 20 jobs, potentially three to five careers over the course of their life. I think many of the people probably in this room have had to switch careers once or twice. That is a relatively new phenomenon. So knowing that that core bedrock skill of self-efficacy, I would say is definitely on the list of predictable over the next 10 years, probably in my view predictable over even more than 10 years. I think there are many other skills which are a little bit harder to predict. So what element of digital literacy, what programming language, what, what type of coding do you teach a young person is a big open question. I think I'm of the view that, that even having an early experience learning one thing, one difficult, complicated, complex problem solving, coding related item, particularly at the high school age, gives you the confidence to learn others later on in life. I would say that is a very big, open, strategic question. Educators around the world disagree about that. We have ministers of education call us and say, please bring JA to our country um, because our programs are free to students. And I will say that there is a strategic question that hasn't been resolved amongst ministers of education about how to introduce a, a, a digital literacy, particularly in the poorest countries, where there are so many other things which are critical to learn. I've got a view on that, but I'm going to hold off on that till later on. Thank Very you. Very good. Thank you. Adrian, your response. Well, well I, think, I think, I mean, first of all, uh, the, the key factor, in my view, uh, to the kind of enabling environment that you're talking about um, is access to the web and access to the internet. And, you know, in a sense, the CEO of the World Wide Web Foundation would say that. Um, but, you know, the whole, the, the, we're at this extraordinary 50-50 moment um, where half the world is online and we have 50% still to go. And as we get closer to 100%, as we get to 60 and 70 and 75, as you all know, the, the unconnected minority become increasingly more vulnerable. I was sitting, I think, in this, in this space yesterday and uh, Chike, Chike Agu from, um, from Everyone On was talking about how even now in the United States, I think he said 90% of children, high school kids, get their homework digitally. What does that mean for the 10%? Um, which will increase in, will in, in, in course become 6% and then 4%. And then you look at that globally and you start to think about everything else that is not accessed uh, by those who are not connected when 80%, say, of their fellow citizens are 
uh, are connected, whether that's the right to vote or the chance to get uh, health care and, and advice on, on health and so on. Um, all sorts of other ways that access to the internet is going to be critical. And, you know, we also heard yesterday that uh, if we're in the world of an internet of things, in fact, there's going to be a trillion things, an internet of a, a trillion things in the next few years. But where are those things going to be and who are they going to be supporting? The key uh, sustainable development goal that applies to this uh, target 9C uh, won't be achieved, access for everybody to the internet, until 2042, which is 22 years behind schedule. And in the meantime, millions of us will be in driverless cars, while billions of us have yet to send our first email. Um, that's not just a world of the haves and the have-nots. I guess that's the, the have-nots and the have bots, if I may say. Um, I thought about that one. Uh, yeah. Didn't really work. Um, so progress is stalling. Uh, we're not accelerating towards that 100%. We need to accelerate. That last mile, that last stretch is going to be the most important if we're to equip everybody with the kind of tools that we all need to take advantage of the opportunity you're describing. Very good. So in, in, in some respects, your, your response to the thesis statement is, we shouldn't even talk about that yet. We've got to get access solved first. I think that's the first point. Yeah. Mansetsa. Well, um, let, let me just agree with the, the first speaker that one of the most critical competences in the 21st century, and that is fairly predictable over the long run, is uh, what we call self-agency, that each and every learner, be they a child, a, 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 an adolescent, an old person, has to be a self-benefiting agent and not somebody who is waiting for things to happen to them, but somebody who can act on their environment, connected or not connected, to bring about a, a, a public and a personal good and somebody who understands what it is they want. They can define that good a priori and know how to use multi-resources to attain that good. But underlying that, the best competence in the long run is to be an efficient and effective lifelong learner. Because what we learn in the 21st century and within Industry 4.0 becomes very quickly obsolete. But if we know how to learn, we will take up the challenge presented to us and the opportunities presented by the context, the new context, learn anew, and be self-renewing all the time. So we have to be effective lifelong learners, which means that education systems have to focus more on how to learn rather than just what to learn. This is not to say what to learn is unimportant. And on the issue of connectivity, this is a huge opportunity, but also a huge risk of exacerbating inequalities and compounding already existing inequalities because the poor are the ones who will get left behind. And if we do really believe that Industry 4.0 is going to accelerate not just the velocity and the pace, but the complexity of change, this means that the game of catch-up is going to be a little bit more daunting than it was in the past centuries. So we can't afford to have anybody left behind. So the access is going to be one of the most critical competences. But beyond access is the filters. Because as you get flooded by information in the 21st century, if you know what your private or public good is, then you have the filters to know what applies to you and what doesn't apply to you. And that's what occupies me most of the time. I work for the International Bureau of Education, which I direct, is based in Geneva. It's a, a Category 1 Institute of UNESCO. I work with 195 countries that are members of UNESCO to help them reinvent their education systems to bring them into the 21st century. And that's no small challenge. Thank you. And, Thank you. and Mary Ann, and I'll, and I'll repeat kind of the summary of the thesis question um, again, that the skills required for work readiness are definable global and predictable. What is your reaction to that? Um, I agree, but I, I will disagree with my colleagues, my, my panelists here. Um, and the reason why I will disagree is that I am the testimony of uh, 
of uneducated, somebody who's never been to school, so I've never sat in a classroom. Um, I've never had any education at all. Um, I started reading and writing when I was 16 years old. Um, today I code seven languages. Uh, I did that under two years uh, in the UK where, I was, uh, where I'm based. And so what I'm looking for really is that uh, a little bit of uh, maybe honesty on, on how the education system failed people around the world. And this is from government, uh, by passing by UNESCO, the United Nations. All these organizations actually failed marginalized people. Uh, and uh, so I'm from Senegal, that's where I was born. And when I look at the education system around the world, and I, I get really alarmed. Uh, I get alarmed because I'm now 43 years old, and I'll be 56 years old in 2030, where many young women and girls will be left behind, literally. And, and the reason why they will be left behind is because I think there is less empathy and compassion and kindness for marginalized communities, because we don't think about the poor people as, uh, as the future workforce. We don't think about that. We don't think about uh, my girls in Uganda today, Leticia, who's 11 years old, will grow up and come to the Web Summit to talk like me, Indeed. to be part of you guys. <laughs> so we don't think about that. And, and I think that's why we need to think about what is our role as society um, and really kind of like try to find a, a different alternative education. Because if you, if you want to find people like myself uh, in the next 10, 20 years coming here as a tech entrepreneur investing in technology but decoding information and coding seven languages from Python to Ruby, uh, basic HTML, this is fascinating. But who's investing in these people? And so that's my question to my fellow panelists, but also the people who are here. And, and, and that's why I created I Am The Code, uh, because I thought I am the code uh, personally. And you are all the code, by the way, because you have a power to go and invest in a young girl in Uganda or in Senegal or in Kinshasa. Not just give them access to the internet, but also try to use the internet as a way of creating jobs for that person. Uh, she can become an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm very lucky to be the first black woman that sits on the World Wide Web Foundation uh, invented by Tim Bernilly. And so this is fascinating. 25 years later, uh, I have a voice on this foundation that is trying to do digital equality, trying to you know, kind of like give the next 50% access. And, and, and that's why my goal is for the next uh, you know, 10, 15 years is to allow one million women and girls to code by 2030 to align ourselves with the United Nations uh, agenda. And this is a very solid data, and, and we're tracking it. Uh, and this is what we need to do, alternative education, to think about the poor people as a future workforce, mm -hmm. and to invest in these people in a more sustained way, not just because we feel pity uh, for them. Uh, thank you, Maryam, and, and thank you for all our panelists. Monsensa, you introduce the, uh, the idea of agency, or introduce the, the word agency into this conversation. Maryam, you are a remarkable, right, extraordinary example of agency. Precisely. How do we globalize agency? Now, you're an example, right? you're someone who is actively engaged in that, but I want to think beyond your, your organization, beyond your circumstance, what are the key structural barriers to broad agency? And I'd ask any one of you to kind of volunteer to go first on this one. I just want to build on the point that Marianne was making that she has not been educated and to fundamentally disagree with her that she's been educated. Perhaps what she means is that she hasn't been schooled and put in a box with walls called a, a, a schools. And the fundamental problem is when we start to equate education and learning with schooling, mm. that's a fundamental problem. We are talking about education and we are talking about education using multimedia access. Whether it's your grandmother who is a super artist and can apprentice you and can mentor you, whether it's from the World Wide Web, whether it's from a peer learner who is teaching you, your colleague, your neighbor, and whatnot. We have to take education and learning out of the boxes called schools. And these are not alternatives, because whenever we talk about alternative education, to me, we, we sort of put it as a footnote when all the resources have gone into schools. And let me say, you are asking, self-agency is, is the, this is the example, somebody who knows what they want 
or they are able to learn what they want as they go and they are able to take the opportunities around them and act for their self-benefit, but also for the benefit of others, working with others, for the benefit of the world, and it goes on. Now she's talking about a million women, or women, young women and girls. This is when self-agency goes beyond the self to the collective, and it goes beyond the collective to the world. And the fundamental issue here is in inequity of access to opportunities for learning, not for schooling. Mm -hmm. I just want to make that clear. I think that's very helpful framing, yes. and I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it further further down the panel. But I mean, as we as we think about reframing the right. notion of education, yes, right, you run straight into a to a set of stakeholders who may not understand that framing. Yeah, exactly. So part of the solution are entirely new things, but certainly we've got to we've got to engage stakeholders, educational institutions, governments, NGOs who think about this problem differently. Um, Adrian, why don't I kick that to you? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think this, this, this point about gender is central because it illustrates the kind of circular problem that we've got of, uh, of often women, not always, often women and girls uh, having, feel, perceiving they have uh, fewer skills, which is the reason why in the research that we've done, they say they are less likely to go online, and when they're online, less likely to engage in things like applying for a job or expressing more controversial opinions in, in, in chat rooms and so on. Um, you know, and that's a circular thing because what, what that can point to is the lack of, of traditional education, if you like. Um, and our research also shows that women who have had a higher level of education are far more likely to go online and to engage much more fully. So, you know, I think, I think that what, what I would say, the answer to your question about agency, is that we have to equip people, especially women and girls, um, from the bottom up with the, with the core uh, skills in a traditional sense as well as in a less traditional sense. And the web can play a big part in that. But also, so can um, movements, frankly. I mean, organizations uh, that we're all part of or that we represent, you know, the, the World Wide Web Foundation is working, for example, with uh, the tech companies and with, uh, with governments and with civil society groups um, in the Alliance for Affordable Internet to try to drive down the price of broadband, an, an effort that's going to make a world of difference, especially for girls and women, um, in, in, order to, in, in, in the interest of getting them online and enabling them to access. So I think agency is going to come from our, all of our endeavors, but it has to be a holistic approach that drives on all of these points at, uh, at once. Great, and I want to come back to the, the, some questions around digital access in just a minute. And Ashish, far be it from me to make you the voice of, of, of legacy institutions, but your organization does work with a broad range yeah. of stakeholder institutions as well as outside them. So I'm interested in your perspective on the role of kind of the traditional infrastructure. Yeah, sure. I, you know, I think that um, one thing that we've learned is there is existing research on how to build agency in young people. So there are education departments that have been studying this particular topic yep, for a long, long time. time. So, and it's data-driven research, um, and let me share some of it with you, which might be relevant. I'm not sure how it ties to sort of traditional institutions as opposed to the way of the future, right? If agency is more important, let's learn how it's taught. There are two things that are needed to actually build agency, self-efficacy in young people. This is based on the research of Albert Bandura, a Stanford professor. The first is exposure to role models, okay? So a young person's more likely to be able to believe in themselves if they meet somebody just like them who's done this. And the second is actually learning by doing. So if you're young and you actually learn how to code at a young age, if you build a business when you're 14 with a title like CEO, you're more likely to feel confident doing it when you're 25 and actually need to. I'll tell you one quick story which really drives the point home. I was recently in India and I was with um, a, a, a group of, a, of 30 girls in A standard. So, you know, 14 years old, 15 years old. And they, um, uh, are daughters of like rickshaw drivers, if you could visualize that for a minute. We took them to an office of, of GE Healthcare. First of all, it was their first time for most of them ever entering an office building. And they saw, oh my God, there's air conditioning in the office building. They'd walk by this building every day in Mumbai, and never gone in. Just the idea of seeing air conditioning changed the mindset, it was a you know, mindset shift. And the next thing that we did is we asked them, how many of you interested in science or chemistry? And about one out of 10 girls raised their hands, about three or four girls raised their hand. And we spent the next few hours exposing them to people just like them who came from their type of background who actually became scientists at GE. 
And one of them in particular sticks out was a woman who works in a GE hospital who's a nutritionist and had studied STEM and nursing. And at the end of the day, we asked the girls, how many are you interested in science or chemistry? The eight out of 10's hands uh, uh, went up. Just because of that one speaker who said, I was just like you, and now look at my job in an air-conditioned setting where I'm actually helping bring nutrition in hospitals across GE. That's what I mean by mindset shift. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So, Miriam, I'm interested in who you see as your key partners in living into and reaching, you know, your, your, your um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, your big goal. I mean, you know, I know GI uh, worldwide. I, I love the work they do. Um, you know, total respect for what they do globally. Um, but I, I think I have a couple of issues I really would like us to think about. I love the, the, the word agencies, and, and, uh, and, and I've taken into consideration schooling as well. <laughs> but, but what is really crucial here is we have millions of agencies around the world who have, who have no access. Yep. And so, but sometimes this is government's job, this is government's work to go and yep. look into the policies around education. Yep. And the reason why my education was failed as a young girl in Senegal, because my government didn't invest enough into education. Mm -hmm. And so we now have the, uh, a monopoly of a couple of organizations around the world just talk about uh, you know, education, especially girls' education. And so what, what I'm trying to find out is how can we move from uh, this static narrative about girls' education but actually invest into these people, create more agencies. It, it's not just a job of GI Worldwide to just have like thousands of uh, agencies, but we need millions of agencies around the world. This is how we're going to you know, build the skills and invest in the skills and create the future workforce we're looking for. And I think the second point is uh, we, we have some young girls today sitting down in Madagascar who are no schooled. They have no access to schooling. They can't go to school because the government have failed. The policy of the government have failed. I just came back from Madagascar two days ago. I've seen young girls who have no access to schooling. And so I'm asking myself for the last 40 years, what have we done for education? Now, the reason why I use the word alternative, someone needs to really think about a different way of giving these people education because there are millions. I mean, the data I'm looking for is huge. Internet, of course, will play a role, access and everything. But, you know, if you wake up every single morning, you don't have a job. You, don't, you can't even dream that you can work. And this, this is a major issue I'm trying to address around the world. And the reason why coding, uh, I'm trying to think about the you know, coding and, and the way I've learned how to code, because I couldn't get a job in the UK. Mm -hmm. I used to do cleaning jobs and working in bars and restaurants. And when I tried to find a job to scale myself to go to work for a major bank, the lady said, no, you don't have diplomas. You do, you, we can't hire you. And so like Ken Robinson said on TED, you know, the creativity, you know, we, we're, skilling, we're killing the creative of these people. So what can we do as a group, as partners, as a global community to invest into education, but also work together rather than duplicating the efforts, actually join forces together to invest into girls' education. Because at the end of the day, agencies are sitting down waiting for us to act. And they're waiting for government to uh, build the policies. They're waiting for the private sector to hire them. They're waiting for communities to be built. They're waiting to, to learn new curriculums or have access to the internet. So what I'm saying is that if we don't work together, collaborate, and have more empathy and compassion towards the agencies, we're not going to access. We can sit down here in the next, uh, you know, in the next 10 years again having the same conversation, Paul. So what? you speak about this in, in almost the language of a movement. And, and Monseta, I'm interested in kind of your take. Does every movement need a clear leader? Yeah. I think every movement needs multiple leaders. We take a network approach to leadership. Yes. Because when we have these glorified leaders who walk on water, mm -hmm. we ignore the fact that Every person who is a self-benefiting agent, empowered, can lead a movement. And what we need is multiple movements working towards a, a, a global public good for the benefit of the collective. So it isn't about, and part of the problem is the inertia induced in people who are leaders because they are not traditionally labeled as leaders. And we have to derail from this notion of leadership where we think there is a leader. There are multiple leaders. But I want to emphasize the point Marianne is making. Even as we talk about self-benefiting agents, they need an enabling environment mm -hmm that offers the opportunity and the context that will enable them to take up those opportunities when you don't even have an opportunity. 
regardless of how you are intrinsically motivated you are, what you may meet actually is a whole lot of barriers, institutional barriers. And one of the institutional barriers is when people are just not given access to opportunities to act on and to demonstrate that agency. Yep. Agency does not work in a vacuum. It needs an enabling environment. And that's what the point he was making. Yep. You take the social learning theory, you have role models. That's one enabler. You put children in an environment where they work inside this office and it opens their eyes. If they never worked into this office, you wouldn't know how much they are self-benefiting agents. So there's a lot of potential out there that is untapped. And part of the problem, and I, I agree with her, you know, impatience, is that often schooling teaches learners, young, bustly, energetic, brilliant kids to be processed, <laughs> batch processed into cohorts moving at a particular pace, whether they, are, they could have done it faster or whatever. So this regimentation of, the so of schooling mm. has to be rethought yes. completely Absolutely. in order to unleash the potential, but we cannot underestimate the enabling environment that is the role of governments and is the role of those who have made it to share mm -hmm. and to lift and have a pull-up effect on others, such as being a role model, yeah. but also such as being a donor, you know, adopt a school. There are so many, but all these people are leaders. And if we take a network approach to leadership, then we can have a snowballing and we can have a momentum. If we wait for that one mysterious leader, we will be waiting for too long and we will be pushing people back instead of allowing them the opportunity to act. Great, well, thank you. And one thank other, Adrian, I'm gonna, I'm gonna return this to you just with a, with a leading question. I mean, as you, as you stated earlier, of course, one of the barriers is lack of digital access. One of the critical, if not foundational, um, elements to achieving um, agency is access to digital. I'm curious your thoughts, though. On, on the one hand, I mean, I think that's, that's not a controversial statement, right? <laughs> digital access is good. But so much of what has gone on with digital is, in other parts of the world, separating us. Digital is one of the primary drivers of income inequality. Do we have to address these issues together, or can we, can we, can we, can we ignore one while addressing the other? No, I think we have to address them together. I mean, because uh, I think it might be a more controversial statement uh, these days <laughs> than, than perhaps it was five years ago. Just, just before I get to that, can I just, just uh, back up the point about leadership and, and movements? I worked on a campaign years ago called Jubilee 2000, uh, which worked to get the, the debts, the, the unpayable debts of the developing countries cancelled around the year 2000. Um, and there were a couple of guys who, who both had some sort of a claim to being the sort of the, the creators of that movement. Um, in fact, there were many people, but two in particular. Uh, and and they had a dispute over it between them. And in the end, we, we asked them both to be, uh, be regarded as honorary co-founders of Jubilee 2000. One of them was called Bill, the other was called Martin. And, uh, and they sort of went along with it. But Bill would always say, yes, I'm very happy to be considered a co-founder of Jubilee 2000. I co-founded it in 1989, and Martin co-founded it in 1993. Um, that was his way of, of understanding it. But, but look, your, your point is bang on. I think it is controversial, actually, <laughs> to say that digital equality is, is a necessary, is, is a must have yeah. in pursuit of, 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 this, uh, of this overall goal that we're talking about. And the reason for that um, is that, you know, the, the notion of the web as a public good is under threat mm -hmm. more than ever before, you know, whether in terms of, uh, of, of data and people's personal data and, and their uh, even understanding of how it's being used, let alone control over it, whether it's in terms of how governments and sometimes corporations restrict access to the internet or large parts of it, or whether it's in the content that we find on, online. And, and here I think you know, everyone has, has more to do. Of course, there's all of the, the challenge around, uh, around misinformation and fake news uh, and hate speech too, um, but also even just language. I mean, if you, if you, if you speak Oromo, you're not, um, you know, you're in good company. There's 25 million who speak Romo in, in, the, in, the, in the Horn of Africa. Um, Facebook has nothing for you. And Google Translate can't help you. 
25 million people, that's not a small number of people. So I think we all have to work together to ensure that the web becomes more of a public good, because yeah. if it becomes more of a public good, we can more justify argue it, that it is a basic human right yeah. Yeah. and that it should be for everyone. Mm -hmm. Very good. Ashish, do you want to add anything at this point? Yeah, I think um, you asked a really central question, which is, uh, should there be a leader of a movement or is it a network? And I completely agree with the network thesis, but I want to add something to it. I think that one of the big things that's, that's happened is the UN Global Goals have clarified how nonprofits and how corporate funders and other stakeholders can cooperate on something that's relatively clear and can align missions. Without that mission alignment, the resource allocation decisions that even my organization makes are less directed. Um, and I'm, I'm actually somewhat disappointed there, are, there, aren't, there isn't more clarity in the tech world around the UN SDGs because I think it's a powerful yeah. catalytic tool. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, and the, it's exactly the role, frankly, I think the UN should be playing is to help define with clarity some measures and targets to actually make progress on complicated social issues. So we've aligned you know, elements of our mission to the SDGs. I was delighted to hear you've got some goals which are SDG aligned. It gives us a means for partnering that's clear. Yes. Mm -hmm. so. Can Thank I, you. I, I totally, um, I, I totally agree with that. And and the United Nations, uh, I was just talking about how do you get governments accountable. And the United Nations, the Sustainable Development Goals, is the best way to do this. And I think we need to also understand that we failed agencies around the world. And now we can, in, uh, by 2030, we can all sit down and say we empowered one million women and girls coders, for example. And then technology will play a massive role in this. I totally agree. And I, I really like the fact that you're taking young girls, for example, into companies. I mean, we're taking tech comp uh, young women, uh, really focus on STEM subjects, taking them across uh, big major tech companies to have an experience. A very small experience. In Brazil, that's what, that's what we did. Young girls in favelas, extremely poor girls. If we don't do anything, they end up having ba children at 14 years old. They end up being raped, end up being trafficked. Really key issues Sustainable Development Goals is addressing. Now, how do you get those girls uh, you know, from Soweto to Mombasa and get those girls into coding classes, organize hackathons where we all together can all build a solution around climate change, for example. But we need to be willing as a, as a global community, as a tech community, and I call for the Web Summit uh, to do the same, to call for these tech companies to invest and really use sustainable development goals as a way of empowering girls. Thank let, you. Let me just quickly underscore that the UN itself is a network. Yeah. And having the privilege of being at the heart of the negotiation of the SDGs, yeah. Being in many sleepless nights, negotiating the language, agreeing how many SDGs we will have, what should be the SDG for education, how should we frame it, what should be the indicators. Yep. At the end of it, it comes together because it's a network mm -hmm. of agencies that take human development from multiple perspectives and a network of multiple leaders at different levels converging to define perhaps an ultimate global public good that focuses all our attention. Yes. And I totally agree. One of the things that to me is a huge disappointment is how the private sector and the tech companies that we look to for the future under invest in education yes. and yet they are the first prime beneficiaries mm. of the best of the crop. True. Because he or she who calls the piper, plays the tune. So because the tech companies are really avant-garde, they, they are leading this industry for all. I know it's much more than just pr production technologies and the internet of things, as you, you mentioned. But at the end of the day, what we need is a merger of governments, UN agencies, we playing a normative role, mm -hmm. setting the norms and standards at a global level, but having government and private sector and individual agents Work together. working together to push the world and to limit the what's going to be horrifying inequalities if we don't do something very urgent about access to the, uh, through and to the World Wide Web. If we don't do something urgent, what we're going to have is actually a collapse of um, the equity goal 
in the SDGs. Mm -hmm. And we know when equity collapses, high inequalities can escalate to social problems, fracture, to political uh, instability, and to lack of peace. And we know this. And when there is no peace, mm. that's the ultimate goal of the UN, by the way. When there is no peace, there is no development, full stop. And on that note, which punctuates the importance of the issues we are dealing with today, I want to thank the panel very much thank for you. a terrific conversation. Thank you. Thank you.